Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And hello again, folks. Welcome to another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray, and we are virtual still. We're not back in our, our normal uh, quarters inside Renaissance Bank in Alpharetta, but we're looking forward to that one of these days. Um, in the meantime, if you need a more personal experience for your business, uh, go check out the folks at Renaissance. Uh, they're happy to see you by appointment, so you need to call ahead and make an appointment, and they'll be happy to uh, have you in the branch to see you. They've got over 200 offices across the South ready to serve you, and they do a great job, and I know that personally from some of the work that I've done with them on clients that I have. Uh, So go to renaissancebank.com, find your local office, give them a call, set up an appointment, and uh, experience the difference. Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. And now we welcome Paul Mitchell, and Paul is uh, president of Mitchell Sales Advisors. Paul, welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for today. Yeah, me too. I've been looking forward to this. It's great to have you on the show. So why don't you give a quick uh, rundown of you and and, um, Mitchell Sales Advisors? Uh, How do you serve folks out there? Yeah, thanks, John. I am an outsourced VP of sales, so... As um, a guy who's been a sales leader for about 30 years, about two, almost two years ago now, I decided to start my own business. And in doing so, um, I realized I had the ability to work with small to mid-sized businesses and, and sometimes larger businesses. I'm working with a $100 million company right now to help them with their sales process. And when I say that, it encompasses so many things. It can encompass compensation plans. It can encompass you know, just the structure of the organization and how we move forward. So many businesses do such a great job of getting to a certain place, but they have, they have just kind of left behind the, the expertise needed to create a foundation to move their sales forward and actually grow exponentially. And, and me and, and a team of advisors across the country that, that do this um, focus on trying to do that with our businesses. And, and it's rewarding. It's rewarding to help people get over that hump and teach them the things that they need to know. And the only reason I know it is because I've done it for 30 years. I've worked with various companies and, and actually helped those companies grow. And, and some companies actually sell profitably. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy and fortunate to be able to do this. It's, it's encouraging and it's allowed me to meet wonderful people like you through this mission, um, through my work, as well as some of the other things that I'm doing to help others. So um, I'm excited and and appreciative for for what I'm doing, how I got here, and uh, I'm excited about doing this and talking to you today. That's great. Now, you've you've got a special, uh, not that sales is not a special mission, because that's a special mission uh, for sure, but your day job supports um, an effort that's really important to you, and that's really our theme today is, is, uh, you know, authentically addressing race in the workplace. And, uh, you talk in terms of a life in black and white. Why don't you tell folks a little bit more about what that means to sure, you personally? To. Absolutely. Thanks, John. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So my, my sales career has kind of springboarded me to, to a place where, where I can start talking about kind of the, my experiences throughout my life. And, and what's happened, and a lot of people ask me, what does a sales leader know about diversity? And um, a lot of it's just my experiences and my, my life in business, my life in social justice, um, my life just personally and who, I, who I've become. When I say a life in black and white, what I mean is I'm, I'm a product of a white mom and a black father from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I grew up in the 60s and 70s there. And, and um, during that time, it was really hard for my mom, who... Uh, had four black children, basically, raising them in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And, was, and she told us at that time to have as little association with white people as possible. Now, that was very confusing because she was a white woman. But mm. um, it, what it meant for me is I was growing up in a black culture. I grew up around nothing but uh, my black friends and black teachers, black coaches. Everything was was that culture around me. And then I went to a historically black college and, 
and in Missouri after after I left Minneapolis to play football. And so for the first 22 years of my life, I was really in a black culture. And when I moved to Los Angeles, I um, <clears throat> I started looking for work, and immediately I got into pretty much a white culture because when you go <clears throat> work for businesses, and especially when you get into sales, you see mainly white people around. Um, those are the face of companies. Those are the ones representing companies. And most importantly, those are the ones leading most of the companies that are out there. So um, now when you look at me, some people would look at me, especially at the time, and not really know what color I was, not really know what I look like, because I'm very fair skin. I'm very light skin. Um, I've got even a bit of a tan now, so I look a little darker. But I'm, 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 a lot of people just didn't know what I was. And you don't talk about race. So it never was brought up. So, um, so my experiences through all of that led me to this place where I am today. And when I talk about my experiences, there, there were times in my business career as a leadership where I would be around people that would use words like the N-word. And I would be in, in a situation where I would have to respond to that. And I was always scared. One time this happened to me in Texas in, in, in the back seat of a car. And um, because they thought they literally must have thought that I was a white person mm. and they started using the word and going back and forth. And my stomach got butterflies because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. And I knew I needed to speak up. And I eventually did and said, you're in the car with one of these N words. And they were mortified. But what I realized so much wasn't so much that I called them out as a black person, but I called them out in their mind as a white person. And I broke with white solidarity. Because those things go on all the time. They just didn't know they were sitting in the car with a black person. And I ended up going through that for most of my career until I met a man named Bill Boyd. And Bill Boyd was a wonderful leader, um, CEO at the time of Muzak, a company I went to work for. And when I went to go work for Muzak, it had been after being in management positions for a number of years. And when I got to that place, I had decided I don't want to be a manager anymore. I just want to be a salesperson. I just want to go out and take care of my family because of all of those kind of things that kept happening. And I, I was in fear because, you know, first of all, I might get a job because they don't really know who I am or what I look like. And they might be more comfortable with me uh, based on the color of my skin. But eventually they would find it out. And if they did, how would they treat me? Would I have to go through these kind of things? Would I have to endure these kind of words and, and things that go on in business that a lot of people either don't address or don't want to acknowledge. And, you know, of course, it was different times then, too. I mean, it wasn't 2000. It was back in the 80s and 90s. And there was a lot of crazy stuff going on then. And so with all of that, I just decided I gave it up. Well, when I went to Muzak, I met this man. Again, his name was Bill Boyd. He was the CEO. And he looked at me one day and said, I want you to be vice president of national sales. And I, and I said, me, seriously? And he saw something in me in terms of talent. But what he saw in me beyond talent was he knew I was a young black man. We had talked. We had gotten in relationship. Mm. And that was a really important thing for him to get to know me. And he didn't choose me as a charity case. He chose me because I thought he thought I could do well for the company. And But also, he acknowledged the fact there were things I just didn't know because most of my career, most of my life had been in a black culture. And then when I got into business, there was no one who really cared about that. So I just kind of continued to get beat down. So he acknowledged all of that. He mentored me not only on the things I needed to know as a sales leader, but as a black, black man in business. I was the first black vice president in 75 years at Muzak. Wow. And that's because someone decided to give me that opportunity to do that. So when the George Floyd incident hit, a lot of my white friends called me and said, Paul, I didn't realize it was so bad. I didn't realize that it was a challenge. And um, it, not so much that they didn't know it was a challenge. They just didn't acknowledge it. They didn't know. And so I realized that what my mentor did for me can be done in so many cl- cases. But it takes a white person, primarily white men, to have some exposure, some education, some compassion, some empathy, just like my mentor did for me, to be able to actually build out systems in in organizations to say, we're going to acknowledge this as a challenge and we're going to do something with it. So I started doing webinars and speaking to people literally one-on-one about my experiences, not trying to, 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 to tell people they're right or wrong because there's empathy on both sides. The reality is, is that 
to break with white solidarity is really hard. I had one of my white friends tell me that I think I've been afraid to do this for so long because I didn't want people to treat my family differently. I didn't want people to turn against me and my community. It's hard on both sides. We have to be compassionate for everybody. And it starts with understanding the systemic racism and challenges that black people have felt for 400 years, literally. And there's doc, you know, documented understanding of all of that. And it's just when I believe when good people learn more about that, they will become more empathetic towards it and, and look for ways to help. So that's been my mission to try to help with that through that process and what I've learned throughout the years in business and in life. So Paul, Paul, you mentioned um, your mentor, Bill Boyd and, and coming uh, him really, I guess, understanding that it wasn't just a matter of promoting you and recognizing the fact you could sell and you could uh, run a national sales effort. Um, but there were things you needed to know about how, I guess, how the world worked, right? I mean, that maybe as, as a black man coming from a black culture, you need to understand about, uh, white business culture. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about that because, you know, I think folks think if I just give, uh, you know, rising black, uh, uh, entrepreneurs and business people, the opportunity, they should take advantage of that. And, and that's such a great, great point and question, John, because it is the assumption that, yeah, you've got every opportunity, the same opportunities I have. But right. once you, even if you give them the opportunity through any source, whether it's affirmative action or, or any type of funding, there's still this chasm of now I've got to start doing business in a white world. How do I do that? And there's things as simple as literally I didn't know how to go out and have a business day. I didn't know how to do something like that when I first got into those positions. But one of the things young black people, and I told, told my children this, that we all learn and Bill helped me with by and, and came to me and pulled me aside and talked to me about was we teach our children, you can't be just as good. You have to be better. So I talked to a young man uh, last week who's a leader at a big company, a big technology company, and he says, I know I have to be 15, 20 percent better than everybody else here on the leadership team. I'm the only black leader and I have to be better else. No one else will ever get a chance. And I'm measured that way. Mm. And that's where we all go into those situations. So I would be sitting in a room in a board meeting there at, at Muzak and, and I would get so argumentative trying to make my point because I wanted to prove to everybody I belonged. I wanted to say my way is right. Do it my way. And and because of all of that ingrained in me that I have to be better than these people sitting at the table, I became a person who, who wanted to always be right. I had to always be right. And Bill pulled me out of a meeting one time and looked at me and said, Paul, you know, I just want you to know, I know where you're coming from, but I want you to understand there's more than one way to answer a question. There's more than one way to solve a problem mm. like that. And he didn't say, Paul, you, you don't always have to be right. He didn't scold me. He just said, there's more than one way to solve a problem. And for me, that was really profound. It helped me understand and take a step back and say, this isn't about me. This isn't about all the things that I've endured, the challenges I'm feeling. Um, in, this, in this culture, in this business world, you don't have to always be right. And you don't have to prove yourself all the time. And that was, for me, profound. That changed things for me and helped me understand exactly what that meant. So things like that that he would do to me and call me on things he knew that were challenging. And, 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 and again, that was scalable. That was because he was exposed and had been educated and had been around other people that he saw doing the same things. Mm. And that's, that's what I think we can teach to one another and show each other and show white leaders to say, um, in the end, this doesn't have to happen because a lot of it is just misunderstanding, and lack of knowledge. Some of it's purposeful and just, you know, for subjugation and things like that. But most of it, Honestly, most of the people I've met want to know more and understand more. They just don't. So they don't know what to say or what to do. We can help with that. Let's, let's talk a little bit about why. I guess the answer may seem obvious. I mean, you mentioned the George Floyd incident that really got um, this on the radar screen for white people. 
mm-hmm. um, in a way that it, it never had before. Um, but, but why is it particularly important for business leaders to address this topic now? Yeah. Well, in, in it, that's a, such a great question, John, because it's always been important for business leaders to address this topic. My mentor addressed this with me back in the late 90s, early 2000s. So mm-hmm. um, it's always been important. And for me, it's it's interesting because, of, of, and, and I have a lot of white friends that do some amazing work. I do a lot of social justice work. I used to, before the pandemic, I used to go to ju- juvenile detention centers. I is, used to work with homeboy industries where I'm volunteering to work with young men. Um, but most, and, and I used to coach school, coach football in Compton, California, predominantly black areas where I was going in to try to help lift these young black people up and trying to help young men and, and you know, black and brown, um, to be able to see their worth and understand that just because you grew up in a gang territory, it doesn't have to define you. It's really hard and nobody knows what that's like until they've been through it. Um, and father Greg Boyle, who ran, uh, who runs Homeboy said, just let's get in relationship with people. And I learned that. And I started applying that to my business mm. um, as a business leader, um, doing things with the people in my organization and, and giving them the tools, being more of a servant leader just because of that, that work I was doing. Um, but at the time, it never thought, it never occurred to me that, you know, the real issue here is white people need education. I can go out and lift up all the black people I can, but eventually they're going to get to a point, even if they do go to college and get out, they're still going to face this same challenge unless we help other people, help white people understand what all this means to them and what they've been through. The kids I coached in Compton, one of them went to college and and got a degree and came out and still couldn't really find work, wasn't given chances, wasn't able to even compete. Um, and, and this was a huge thing for him just to go to college. And so he became a little disillusioned because he, he gets out and he starts thinking, okay, I've done all the right things and I haven't, I'm still not getting the opportunities I see other people getting. So I think why now, when you, when you mention this, it really came about for me where the light bulb came on when so many of my white friends were calling and saying, this is wrong. This is something we should do. We all have to become more, more uncomfortable. I think when for those eight minutes and 46 seconds of watching someone on video lose their life um, and, and someone just kind of be, do it in a, such a callous way of not worrying about as if that life mattered at all, I think that affected all of us. And for me, I said, OK, it doesn't mean we stop doing social justice work. It doesn't mean we just stop helping people on the margins, but we need to start affecting change dramatically. And that and for me. Because I have, I interact with so many white people through business, and I have for 30 years. I said, I want to talk to these folks. And I want to talk to them without, without holding back, with empathy towards what they need to learn, but hope, hopeful, hopefulness that they will understand and hear what's been going on. Educate them on, on racial injustices that have gone over the years. I mean, the reality of, you know, just things like racial zoning and redlining where Black people, men would come back from World War II and actually couldn't get buy a home. So I live in Los Angeles and I live in Plato Ray, a fairly affluent area. And one of the cities next to me is Manhattan Beach. And they that's one of the wealthiest areas in the country. Those white men from World War II could come back and buy a home back then in the 1950s and 60s, which they probably still own now, which is probably worth five, six, seven million dollars. They left a legacy. They left an inheritance to their kids. Black families weren't able to do that. They were told, you got to go live over here. You can't do that. So when you just look at just something like that, and there's so many other things we can get into, when you just look at something like that, how can you not have empathy and say, these folks don't have the same, it's not a level playing field. They're not getting the same education. Because they're living in poorer neighborhoods, what it means is they're not getting, they're not paying the same taxes to get the same education as the, the kids that are living in these nicer neighborhoods. And it just constantly snowballs and goes. And so my thought is we talk to people about that. We share that understanding. I share what my mentor did with me. And then we can go out and affect change by actually wanting to. You know, I I say in one of my speaking, my discussions is, you know, the poet Rumi says, your heart knows the way, follow in that direction. And if your heart calls you to do this, um, there's an opportunity for us to help and as a sales leader, I always say that I'm a problem solver. 
as a leader of, you know, Mitchell Sales Advisors, I go into businesses and I don't know what I'm getting into. I'm problem solving. This is a huge problem we can solve and I have an expertise to do that. And, and in essence, though, a lot of people think salespeople convince people to do things. I'm not trying to convince anybody to do anything. I just want people to be educated and want to hear more and hope that em- empathy and compassion will lead the way once they understand more and so we can move forward together. Folks, we're here with Paul Mitchell, and Paul is uh, president of Mitchell Sales Advisors, and we're uh, discussing a life in black and white, uh, which describes his life um, and how to authentically discuss race in the workplace. And, and so, so to that point, you know, we're, there's a lot of different aspects to racial problems in this country. And, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're going to focus a little bit on the workplace part of that. So what should, um, business leaders, white business leaders do when they want to do something in their workplace, they want to affect change in their workplace uh, that hopefully ripples. Um, how should they approach that? And what, yeah. should, what should they do? Great question. I think um, it starts with authenticity. It starts with authentically wanting to understand the, the people and the culture in your organization and where it's good and where it's bad. So many people don't want to hear that something isn't fitting within the mold of what they want their culture to be. And the, the first step is to understand that and learn that. So many companies put out statements after George Floyd died on Black Lives Matter. And so many companies got slapped back saying, well, if Black Lives Matter, how come your r- racial pay gap is so much different? How come you don't have any black people or brown people in any leadership positions? How come you're, you only have 1% black in your organization? So if that matters, then your house would be in a better place. So to your question, the first step is look at what you're doing and start with yourself as the leader of that organization. How can I educate and expose myself to what really matters to the the minorities and the, the, the people that require diversity in our business? What can I do? And that starts with leadership. And that's where I'm going is saying, let's talk about where you have challenges because people do have challenges. They don't understand perhaps what black lives matter means. They don't understand perhaps what it, sh- it means to be able to have a diverse race for uh, workforce and what that understanding can mean to their business. So let's educate on that. Let's start there. And then once we start doing that, we can start developing programs and plans that are scalable. Like my mentor did with me. I know a company that created a black black network in their organization. So black people can talk and come together and, and say, this is how I'm feeling and take that and have conversations with the CEO about that. And then out of that, perhaps they can come up with a strategy that's unique to their company to help empower folks. Um, I believe in a mentorship program. I think, you know, what Bill did for me is scalable in that if you incentivize people to be part of a men- mentorship program, to say we're acknowledging that this is this is a challenge and there's things that we need to help young black people with as they come into these organizations. And and you you set it up where it's something where the company is supporting and saying this is part of who we are, this is part of our culture. If you do things like that, now it becomes meaningful. Now we're acknowledging that there's a challenge here, which we all have to, because that's part of the problem with with black people, they don't feel like they're being heard. They're being seen when they come into organizations as young black people with a different culture, perhaps a different way of talking, perhaps a different, a different perspective on the world, always coming from a, a, a world view that they have to try to be in this other category. Whereas white people don't have to worry about that. Their worldview is their category. It's who they are. It's what it is. That's the race. Every other black, brown, Asian, everyone else, is looking to that as its guide because all the leadership is there. Most of the prosperity is there. Everything is there. So it's understanding that perspective in a business will help us along and help everybody build that. So I think those things, those kind of 
ideas and thought processes unique to each business based on the strategy of just hearing and listening and exposing yourself will create outcomes. And, and a lot of that will just create empathy. And I, and I do believe that if leaders don't do this, they might not care about that 1% or 3% black people that don't want to work for their organization. But if you looked at the protests, 26 million people protested around the world after George Floyd's death. 26 million. Everybody focuses on the riots. That was a small percentage of that 26 million. And those are bad. No one's dis- disputing that. But the reality is, is a lot of those 26 million were white people from other countries. Young white people are looking at this and saying, I don't want to work in companies that are like that anymore. Mm. I don't want to be in those cultures. That's not something that I want to be a part of. And these young people are choosing to do what they want and work where they want, where they see that these things are, are, are excelling. And, you know, the Boston consulting group came out with a study recently that, that this kind of diversity, diversity, and this is, was across the world. They surveyed 1700 companies across the world and said, this kind of diversity leads to innovation and innovation leads to revenues. So they found increasing revenues in these companies that were becoming more and more diverse. And that's not, not just black, it's brown, it's women, it's all of the things that bring us together as a melting pot we say we are when it comes to these things, but we're not like that in business. So not only will it hurt the culture if you don't do this, because I do think a lot of people, a lot of people not of color will start standing up against this and not want to work places they want to, but I also think the re- it's going to impact their business, their revenue, if you don't start, if you keep stifling this. Because what happens when this, ha- when when racial tension happens, people become fearful and they go to the place they're most comfortable, which right. completely stifles innovation. Yeah, and uh, you, you mentioned that one study from uh, from Boston Consulting. There are multiple studies that show this, yeah. uh, folks. So uh, let, let's. Uh, I'm happy to take an email from anybody who wants to argue that point, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, cause there, there's a lot of studies about this, uh, whether it, it relates to S and P 500 returns or pr- profitability or productivity or what have you. But, um, but let's go back, uh, if we can to just this notion of mentoring, what you're talking about, Paul is going beyond, uh, I guess the multiple books on racism, the, the the book lists that have come out that white people need to read, right? I mean, and as good as we're and worthy as that uh, activity is, you're talking about hands on. Um, let me roll up my sleeves and get to know uh, a person or a number of people that are in my care. Uh, mental active mentoring, and I think some white folks think uh, typically come up with, Hey, I, you know, I'm con- they might want to do it, but what they say is I'm concerned. I might say the wrong thing. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so ad- address that specifically, if you would. Yep. I, well, I think you said it right. Is that the first step comes education and, mm-hmm. and it comes, you know, the fact that you want to be sensitive to things that are, that affect people, the way they are. I mean, let's be honest, black people have been, have had to be sensitive to what they say around white, white people for since the beginning of time. If you can't say a certain thing, you could literally lose your life if you'd say the wrong thing. All we're asking for is from white people, from white people is to educate yourself, to not do things that are insensitive, to not, to be aware of the things that affect people. Um, don't, don't, don't you, don't call the a place where all black people live a ghetto. Don't assume that, you know, because a, a black person lives in a primarily black area that they're coming, they live in a bad area. Um, things like that, that continue to happen. You have to educate yourself on making sure you're not insensitive. It is starts with the education. But here's the thing, John, it's, it's the dialogue. It's I, I'm, I'm more comfortable with you coming to me and saying, hey, Paul, I don't understand that. I've had so many white people. I've had such great conversations saying. I don't understand why people say all black lives matter. I don't want to, I want to understand why, why you wouldn't say all lives matter. Help me understand that. You ask that question and you want to listen authentically and hear and wait for the response. Not, not already have a response in your head, but listen to the response and acknowledge it and care about it. That's where the relationship starts and mentoring becomes easy. 
when my mentor was teaching me or, and showing me things, he would ask me questions about myself. And he would, he would, he would actually not tell me what he thought or cared. He wanted to hear what I had to say. He authentically wanted to listen. That's a, that's, that's a trait. And, you know, I was listening to Brene Brown recently, and she talked about how empathy is, is a learned skill. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what that really comes down to is I want to hear you because I want to put myself in your shoes. I want to know what it's like to be a black person in this country. Tell me about that. You, if you start working, talking to people authentically through mentoring to do that, when you start saying now, like Bill came to me and said, Paul, there's not one way to answer these questions. I listened to him because I knew authentically he had built a relationship with me and cared and had my best interests in mind. That's all. I, that's what I'm speaking of getting mm -hmm. enough ex expectation and, and understanding enough. So you're empathetic. You're willing to put yourself in someone else's shoes and listen to what they're saying so that now we can have a relationship and we can move forward to the betterment of all of us. That's the goal. And, and this is, uh, and you and I have talked about this before we came on the air a couple times. Um, this is not about me, let's say, assuming shame, guilt over what has happened in the past. This is doing what I can do today to, uh, in my part of the world to make change. Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. So I tell a story in my webinars about my brother. Um, my brother was not a good person to me. I grew up in a family where my mom was in prison when I was a kid. My, my sister had a heroin addiction. She ended up becoming a wonderful um, Christian person who taught me you know, to, be, to be godly in so many ways. But I had a brother who I, I had a challenging life with most of my life who, who just was very selfish. And, um, but later in his life, he got cancer, and I became his primary caretaker. And we, we became closer through that. You know, those kind of things humble you. Mm -hmm. they, they, they help us all understand what's really important in this life. And, um, you know, four of my family members, three of them died of cancer while I was caretaking. And the fourth, there were six of us, died of an infection. Um, but my brother said something to me. Something happened when we were at the VA, and I was putting him uh, will tearing him through the VA to get his chemo. And a guy walked up to him and said, um, Ward Mitchell. And my brother kind of lifted his head up very groggy. He said, yes. He says, thank you. You saved my life. And so my brother for the last 10 years of his life had started working with the homeless and mentally ill in Santa Monica, California. He had found this man a home and a job completely changed his life by doing that, by taking the time to do that. So I asked my brother, I said, why did you do that? Why did, why, did it make, why did you start doing that with your life? And he looked at me and said, Paul, I've done so much wrong in my life. I needed to do some good. Maya Angelou has a quote that says, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. So to your point, John, is that in the end, it, of course, it matters what we've done to this point. But sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. My mm -hmm. brother didn't know what he didn't know until he realized that he needed to start doing some good. A lot of white people don't know what they don't know until they know better. But once you know better, now let's do better. That's our opportunity right now. And that's my hope in talking to as many people as I can to help them know better so they can start doing better. So we all can start doing better. Folks, we're here with Paul Mitchell, and Paul is uh, president of Mitchell sales advisors and um he's on a special mission <laughs> uh and that is to uh, uh talk about a life in black and white and how to uh authentically discuss and address race in the workplace and uh how to, how to make our world better in in our little part of it um Paul, I want to talk about what you're doing specifically because we we you're doing some great work out there. Uh, and you're really using your current business to support that work. Um, um, so talk a little bit about how you're, uh, how you're plugging in and how you're helping companies and individuals and some of the, some of that, um, activity. Yeah. 
it's kind of what Father Greg taught me to do. Just start getting in relationship with people. So I've done a couple of webinars. Um, obviously, I'm doing a podcast with you. I want to start doing some podcasts where I have guests on and, and I can interview people. I'm setting up a website uh, called A Life in Black and White. And it's light, um, lifeinbw.com. And still under construction, we're finishing a couple videos and then it'll be up. But the goal of all of that is to be able to kind of talk about that mentorship. So, for example, what I want to try to do is create a place where there's resources for people to come and talk about. There's there's a place where people can say, this happened in my business. What should I do? Kind of a blog post so that we can start being in relationship with people, like-minded people who authentically want to look for ways to change, but are looking for ways on how to do it. Mm. Let's start talking about what that means. I want to help people with that, whether it's an individual, and I've had so many amazing individual conversations, and I've had conversations with companies where I've went in and spoke to them. I've I've talked to alumni groups, and I I can just constantly, my goal is to try to talk to as many people as I can to affect this. Literally, if someone calls me today and says, Paul, I want to learn more, I want to understand more. We'll have one-on-one conversations, so that's effective. And but the goal of the website is to do that, as well as to educate the white business leaders, and hopefully create a place where we can outline various models that are working. Um, this is what's worked for this company. This is what's worked for this other company. Um, like I said, I know companies that have created black networks that I'm working with. That that and through that, they need to create a strategy out of that, and that's what I'm going to help them with. But the, crea- the the fact that they're at least trying to communicate and get, have, have a starting point is what's next and what's the strategy that comes out of that. Um, on the website, we also want to set up a coaching mechanism. We want to we want to talk to young black men. I'm a, I'm a member of a, a black fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi. And my thought is, is we can continue working with young college students and put together a network of college students that can be mentored by people like you, John, by people in business, whether you're white or black and start saying, let me, let me help get you ready for when this, this company who is friendly to diversity wants to hire you Mm. because there is some lifting up of the young people to say, this is what you're in store for. This is what you're going to see. I had no idea what I was in store for when I started working for my first white company. I had no idea how different it was and how I need to silence myself and, and all the things like that. Well, you don't, you shouldn't have to do that. You should be able to enter a company where you can be yourself and be vulnerable, but it also acknowledges where you've come from and acknowledges the challenges you've faced. So I think w- the goal is to try to create this, this community of people that are willing to understand what black young black men and women go through, as well as to be able to um, bring up, you know, young black people into those situations so we can marry the two of them together and build a better mousetrap. And, you know, there's a network that I found called the Hidden Genius Network. It's a network um, and it's pretty hiddengeniusnetwork.org. And it's pretty fascinating where it's a place for young black men to go to so that they can actually find jobs in tech. Tech has 1% black in it. Mm. And part of it is just exposure. And sometimes and so they can actually do exactly what I'm talking about in technology to partner these young black men with companies that want to hire young black people. Now, you know, want to your point earlier, wanting to hire them and actually helping them once they get there is the key. That's the challenge because studies have shown through a, a number of wonderful HR people that I know that more black people leave after the first year of being in a company because they, they weren't successful. They were measured against their white peers and they weren't able to measure up because they, they had a, a, a cultural gap to try to fill while they were just trying to do the work. So um, it's not sustainable. And then, you know, that white company raised their hands and says, well, I tried, we tried. Well, that's not, that's not what's miss, the missing link here. The missing link is once they get there, we need to put a mechanism in place to ensure that they're, they're as successful as their white counterparts, because they do have a gap to fill that the white, young white people don't. Yeah, there, there are two things I want. I wish you would address and one at a time because they're kind of two different issues. I mean, one is is that small smaller company where you've got a devoted entrepreneur that wants to make a difference. And, and then there's the company that maybe says, look, we're, we're colorblind. We don't look at color. 
talk about the problems with that way of looking at the world. Yeah. I'll start with the big company. Um, the big companies are way, way more um, capable of doing this. Um, now, it, it may seem more daunting because they have more comp- they have more people, but their resources are so much bigger. Sure. They have they, and, and, and they and they actually have the opportunity to create methodology and scalable solutions that small companies can start mo- modeling in small ways. So, um, but the concept of color blindness always frustrates me because as soon as a black person, a white person walks in a room, they say there's a black person, there's a white person. Um, everybody acknowledges color. It just is what it is. And and um, when we say we don't acknowledge color, we're, on, we're actually going back to that place I was talking about earlier about being insensitive because now I'm not appreciating your perspective because when you don't acknowledge color, what you're saying is everybody's white or everybody's going to live up to those white standards. That's what you're saying because that's the standard. Let's be honest. I mean, when you look at magazines, you look at movies, you look at everything, it's primarily the white race. And that's what it is. So when you're colorblind, you're basically saying everybody's at that standard, which is just not the case. Um, more black people come up in poverty, grow up in poverty. Right. Just today, I mean, five times as many black and brown people are dying of COVID than white people. Mm. That's going to affect generations of people. I mean, their families and everything and how that you know, that, that, that change in just the, the, the social environment, healthcare, all the stuff that went into that is challenging. So that black person walking in with that white person has went through and has a whole different perspective. So when you say you're colorblind, you're kind of dismissing the fact and the pain and the challenges that black people feel versus white people lumping them all in the same category. It's just simply not fair. But I think Big companies have an opportunity to create scalable programs that that young, you know, and I had a, a, a great friend of mine who's a entre- young op- entrepreneur. He owns a has about a five million dollar business, 25 employees been running it for 30 years. And he's one of the first people to call and said, Paul, what can I do? What can I do? And what I always tell people what they can do first is expose yourself, educate yourself and then go home, go home. A friend, a great friend of mine in HR, Margaret Hinch, she owns Salt Lens Consulting. She said to me, she sat in a diversity training and it was all white people in the audience. And at the end, they all said, what can we do? Can we go out and help in the black community? Can we go mentor somewhere? Can we do this? And the instructor said, just go home. Just go home and talk to people about what you've learned. When someone says something that's not true about another race, speak up. Mm. Don't be afraid. Um, educate yourself on what that looks like. And, and, and then, then you can start showing authenticity in everything that you're doing. You'll start seeing how it bleeds over in your work. And, and here's the thing that I believe that if you start doing this in your, in your company, in your cultures, it's going to bleed into your home. After my mentor started doing this with me, I started becoming a much better person. I started mentoring more. I started going on mission trips more active in my church. I, I, I started building confidence in things and in, in, in with all sorts of people that I needed to build confidence with. Mm. It changed everything, not just in my home, but in my community. See, people don't understand how much their work can lift them up or bring them down. And if your work is bringing you down because you're in this vulnerable situation and you're going there not knowing how you're going to be treated or how you're good, someone could say something today that's going to completely change your day in your life, and that changes things. That affects you. And so what, what I'm speaking of is the culture. My mentor, and I'm not saying I didn't have bad days at work, but what my mentor taught me was a foundation of the way we're supposed to treat people. And then I met people like Father Greg Boyle who talked to me about relationship. And by, by having the courage to do that because of what the courage I built up at work allowed me to become a better father, husband, uh, mentor, and, and, and person going out in my community and doing good. I think all of that matters, and it all comes out of a lot of what we do at work, to be quite honest, because we spend a lot of time there. And your call to seek authentic relationship really addresses, I think, the the problem that some white folks have after they get educated and learn more is it's so overwhelming 
it's like what wh- how what can I do because it's so overwhelming. I mean, it's almost like a uh, deer in the headlights frozen. Uh right? And what you, your call to relationship it really isn't is a answer to that uh dilemma that that some white folks have as they learn. 100%. It, it's all it is. It's a, it's, it's that it, it's getting to know people. It's us. You know, it's like when I would go down to homeboy and sit and get to know these gang members, I was never a gang member. I didn't, I mean, I didn't, I came up in a challenging environment, but I don't know what it's like every day to wake up and get beat up until you decide to jump into a gang. Mm. I have no idea what it's like to be 13, 14 years old and have that kind of pressure on you or your parents to be already in a gang. And so I just sat and listened. And by listening, I became empathetic and I started understanding. And you learn not to judge. You learn not to be in a position where you're, you're saying, oh, they should be able to do as much as I can. You know, that's the biggest thing. It's, it's like black people are victims. We're, it's not vic, vic, being victimized. It's all reasons. It's all reasons. So let's hear each other out for their reasons. Because, you know, quite honestly, it's not that white people don't have problems. I mean, they have sickness. They have all the same problems we have. The only difference and the only privilege they have because of it, it's not because of the color of their skin. That's the difference. And so when we acknowledge that, that black people and brown people have challenges because of the color of their skin, not because they don't have, we all don't have different problems, um, that we start seeing, seeing our way to empathy. We start understanding. You know, like I say, my kids grew up in, in a nice area and didn't have to join a gang. They just didn't. They weren't even exposed to it. Mm-hmm. And there's so many kids in Los Angeles like that, not like that. But, you know, I chose to go out and find the ones that did so I could learn and understand and see where I could be empathetic. And that's what we're supposed to do. And we can start with our businesses. I mean, let's be honest. These people are coming into our work. They're part of our team. Let's do that there. If, imagine if we just do that there and we, 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 we treat people that way in our businesses, how much more we'll get out of them and how much better our culture at work will be and our communities will be. Wow. This has been awesome. Uh, Paul, I, I could go on <laughs> chatting with you for quite a while, but we probably need to give people what I hope they're waiting for, which is how they can get in touch with you sure. if they'd like to learn more and maybe have you speak or, or, uh, have you, uh, help them in some way as they navigate their own business situation. Yep. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Paul Mitchell, uh, Mitchell sales advisors powered by sales acceleration. Um, my email address is P Mitchell at sales acceleration.com. My telephone number is 310-946-9287. I am open to anybody calling me and reaching out and talking to me about this. Um, I give a lot of that information out just because that's the way we get in relationship with people. We can't, we can't hide behind a bunch of other things and we have to start talking. And I'm willing to talk to anybody about this. It's fascinating the number of people that have reached out to me and told me their stories of how they're learning and working through this. And to your, you said a word earlier, John, that's so impactful is shame. It's like, don't feel shame. Don't feel bad. I've had people call me saying, I'm ashamed. I am ashamed. And it's again, like my Angelou said, when you know better, do better. That's mm-hmm. all that matters. When you know, if you know better, and I'm so proud of the people that have reached out to me and, and told me their stories of how they're getting their kids involved and how they're understanding and how they're having these conversations it's, it's, it's empowering. It's, it's fascinating. And it's, it's exactly the way our world is meant to be. It's how quite honestly, God made us. So, um, I'm inspired by that and I'm hopeful that those conversations will continue going and I'm opening myself up to do that as often and as many as possible. Wow. Inspirational words from Paul Mitchell, uh, folks, uh, Mitchell sales advisors and, um, a man on a mission, uh, uh, with his uh, work in a life in black and white. Paul, this has been great. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, John. It was an honor. Yeah, it. Thank you so much. Folks, just a quick reminder that you can uh, find this show on all the major podcast apps. Uh, just search for North Fulton Business Radio and you'll find us. Yes, we're on all of them. I'm not going to mention one or two. We're on all of them. So check us out. Uh, and uh, 
we'd love it if you'd subscribe and give us a great review because it helps folks find the show. And it's not about me or the show itself. It's about our guests because we make it about the guests and, uh, cause we want people to find, uh, uh, about the work of folks like Paul and the other guests we've had over these, some 270 plus episodes that we've done to date. Uh, we're also on, uh, social media, North Fulton BRX on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So connect with us there as well. For my guest, Paul Mitchell, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on North Fulton Business Radio.